Welcome back to the Greg Horrenda Show, where today we are honored, truly honored, by a judge and a judge of our own Hall of Fame, just tremendous basketball player, person, author, historian. What does he not do? Judge Jay Jorgensen on the Greg Horrenda Show. Jay, welcome to WFDU. Thanks. It's good to, good to be back again and associated with FDU. Jay, I got to admit to you, every night that I go to bed, I would say now for the last maybe two or three years, I watch MTV. And I, the final show that I watch is Perry Mason. Okay. And I am enamored with Perry Mason and the court system. And so I have a lot of questions about, forget about you being a great high school player at JFK in Island and being a Hall of Fame player. What it really intrigues me, we, we, you're our first judge. Okay. Where do you keep, like, is, that, is there a closet there? Where do you keep the, your black cloak, man? Where do you keep your garb? You do. <laughs> wow. And do you have to buy it, or does the state? How do you get your uh, no? Your it's no yes. We we have to. Uh, uh, new judges have to purchase the robes, um, and okay. there's there's only a couple of places in the country that make them. Uh, most people get them from. There's a company down in Virginia, and uh, they're very expensive <laughs> to to buy these things. So uh, I'm I've sure. had mine since 2000 and, uh, 2002. So it's it, it it holds up pretty well. <laughs> so. I always ask our, our guests about, you know, when was the first moment you knew you were going to be a, a basketball player or when you were going to be a radio host? Was there ever a moment in your life when you were in school as a boy or in college and you said, you know what, man, I'm going to be a judge? Like, I, like when did that visual come into play or did it ever come into play or did you just evolve? Uh, through law and through your education to become a judge. How'd that, how'd that happen? Well, going, going into college, I was, I was going to be a high school history teacher and, and coach basketball. Yes. And then it developed and I was going to be a college professor, history professor, because I really enjoyed it. Uh, but I, I uh, wasn't going to be able, because European Enlightenment was my, was my, uh, uh, was my gig, and, and I, but I, I have a problem with the languages. And I, I need to uh, have at least two foreign languages under my belt. That wasn't going to happen, so I decided. Well, I'll go uh, law as a career, sure. and um, I was fortunate. Got into law school and, and, and came out and started practicing law, uh, essentially in my hometown, uh, which was which was nice for me. Um, but after about uh, oh, ten years or so, uh, I was appointed as a municipal court judge in my township, uh, where I served for fifteen years, and, and that kind of gave me a taste of of um, what it might be to be a full time municipal court judges are are part time. You have a law practice. And, and you have a court at night, a uh, traffic court. Um, so around 2005 or so, uh, I thought that um, I might like to get onto the, to the New Jersey Superior Court. Now, New Jersey is different from most states in that we don't uh, elect our judges. Instead, they're appointed by the governor with the advice and consent of the uh, Senate. So uh, it's really difficult to wake up one morning and say, yeah, I'm, I, I'm going to be a judge. It doesn't quite happen. Uh, but Probably around 2005 was when I thought it would be nice to get on to the uh, Superior Court bench. And uh, I was sworn in as a Superior Court judge, which was a full-time judge in 2008. So it took a couple of years to, to, to make that happen. Jay, a little bit out of the box. Um, when you're a judge and then you're a person, you know, and you have interests and you go to dinner and, and just live in society, I'm always intrigued by the fact that you might run into people. And obviously, in some cases, it's not a, 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 a good meeting. Right. Like, is that like, if you, is that like come into play when you do things publicly or does it affect, you know, your ability to, to just live a normal life? Because when you're a judge, you're held in esteem and you make, um, you know, cases and, um, decisions that alter people's lives. Is that ever an issue or a problem or something in the back of your mind? Um, it's a little bit in the back of the mind. You know, we have to kind of 
watch our surroundings uh, type of thing. Um, yes. But I, but I did have one encounter with, with an individual when I was a municipal court judge. Uh, I was in a, a, a staple store in, in my hometown. Right. And uh, checking out and, and about 15 feet away, there was a guy that was looking at me uh, pretty intently. And I thought, okay, it's, you know, Right. And I walks over and and uh, he said, "You're you're the judge, aren't you?" And I said, "Yes, I I, I am." I said, "I'm sorry, I, I don't I don't recall or remember you." He right. said, "No, no, I I wasn't I was never been in front of you, but I might be in the future, and I just want to introduce myself just in case." <laughs> <laughs> so I oh, thought that was that was a nice preemptive type of thing. So <laughs> uh, yeah, he was greasing the wheel, right? I, I, That's I right. Like that. I like that guy. Yeah, Jay, going back now to your basketball acumen. I mean, you were a terrific high school basketball player. Your son, I got, again, you scored 1,400 points. Your son, Bobby, scored 1,000 points. And, and that's incredible in its, its own right. But w when did you become a really good player? Tell me about Jay Jorgensen when he was like 8 to 12. Were you just the biggest kid on the block? Or when did you evolve into a, a great player that you evolved into here at Fairleigh Dickinson? I, I, I was always the biggest kid on the block. I can tell. Uh, <laughs> uh, I remember what, you know, in, in, I'm six foot five now. In, in, in uh, fourth or ninth grade, I was uh, six foot four. Um, but I, I, growing up, I, I played baseball and I played basketball, I played some football, uh, but I was really interested in baseball. I, I, I was absolutely convinced I'd become a major league pitcher. Um, that, that didn't happen. And then, uh, in, when I was in eighth grade, um, the, my high school that I was going to be going to was in the midst of setting the state record for most consecutive losses. Um, they weren't very good and they bought in a new, a new coach, uh, who had coached at, uh, Perth Amboy high school, which was okay. a powerhouse back in the sixties. Sure. And, uh, by the name of Ray Newman. And he was relatively young and he decided that he was going to build the program uh, there for JFK High School, and he started. And he was he was a junior high coach and I uh, junior high uh, gym teacher, uh, and so he started doing something called a uh, he called it his basketball club. And we had about thirty five kids that were in the eighth grade that were in the basketball club. And what he was doing, he was teaching us the fundamentals, and I really took to it. Um, and and uh, fortunately, uh, Coach Newman um, uh, took a liking to me, uh, spent a lot of time with me, and and. Uh, uh, I really, really blossomed under under his, his tutelage. So by the time that I got to the high school as, as a sophomore, uh, I was able to start. I uh, started every game in high school, and uh, we ended up uh, by the time we were seniors, um, that that band of uh, players played all the way through, uh, and we ended up sixth in the state. Uh, so it was it was it was a good it was a good run. We had a lot of, a lot of fun. But probably eighth ninth grade that's when I really started uh, thinking. Right. You know, just focusing on basketball. Um, after my uh, junior season was over, uh, I was unanimous all, all county, and, and I thought, well, you know, this might work out. I might be able to to, to uh, go to college for free, and that's when uh, you know some started getting interest from uh, from different universities. Jay, who recruited you? What other schools uh, showed interest and actively recruited you? Um, I was recruited by LaSalle in, in Fordham, uh, Stonehill College, uh, a Division two up in up in sure. uh, Boston area. Yeah, uh, University of Delaware, um, University of Pennsylvania, um, and Fairleigh Dickinson. Wow. So, what led you to eventually make the decision to come to Fairleigh Dickinson? Well, um, Coach Al Lavalle was the, was a coach at the time. Um, I had a, a, a couple of I knew a couple of players that were playing on the team. He was a lot of a lot of guys from the Jersey area uh, were on Fairleigh Dickinson, um, and. The, the last uh, the campus visit that I had, uh, he, he pulled me over at the end and said something that I thought, you know, I was just thinking about the other day, said, where do you think you're going to live when, when, you know, when college is all over, basketball is over, right. where are you going to live? And um, I like Jersey. I said, I'm, I'm going to be living in Jersey. <laughs> think, think about that, uh, because don't you want to play in, in, in a state where uh, you're, you're ultimately going to uh, be recognized? Sure. By the, by the people. And so that was uh, kind of a sticking point for me. No, it's, it's just common sense, really, at the end of the day. And not only did you have a great career, but you built a friendship, a, a band of brothers at Fairleigh Dickinson that 
as the head coach now. This is my eighth year. Prior to that, I was at Holy Cross, Seton Hall, Yale, East Carolina, a lot of really reputable good schools. And I tell everyone this, I still have not found a school that has the camaraderie and the brotherhood that you guys have. And I'd really like to know, I know we've spoke to this off air, but how does that start? And more importantly, how does that continue, Jay? I know uh, it's the people, but that's hard to do. In this day and age, to stay connected is really hard. How, how have you guys been able to pull that off? Well, it, it, it's kind of a, it's, it's, a, it's about a 10-year swath of players from Curly Dickinson. Uh, the, the common link is we, we all played for Coach Lavallo. Right. And um, you either love them or you hate them. But uh, you have to respect them, <laughs> yep. uh, and so you know, I got there toward the tail end. Uh, I graduated in '78, and Coach Lowe's last year coaching at Fairly, I think, it was 1980. Um, and so I, I was again toward the tail end. But the guys that, that started off with him, uh, Kenny Maxwell, Lee Shulman, Pete right. Kenny, um, I never played with them. But we would always have uh, in, in kind of an alumni scrimmage uh, preseason. And yes. um, so we, we, we got to interact with them. But uh, over the years, we, we really, th th that group of 10 years of, of, of players, uh, we, we've, we've kept in touch. Um, yep. We have, a, I send out a, 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 um, a, a text link to, to all the players. Uh, we have a, a, an annual holiday uh, dinner together where it's up to about 40, 50, 60 people uh, right. come, to, come to the dinners. Unfortunately, we didn't have it this year because of the, of the pandemic. Sure. Um, but, you yeah, know, the, the last time that, that, uh, that I played, it was, was 1978. And, and um, uh, the guys that I graduated, there's four of us that, that came in as freshmen that graduated in 78. Um, <laughs> Seth Greenberg uh, was my roommate for, for my last two years. Uh, yep. Jeff Hunt, uh, Jeff and his wife and my wife and I, we have dinner every uh, at least once a month, uh, every year for the past seven or eight years. Uh, I was in his wedding. He was in my wedding. Uh, Steve McQuinsky uh, lives about two, two, three, four blocks uh, from, from where I live. So we, we've all, we all kept in touch and, and continue to keep in touch. And, yeah. and uh, the, the nice part about it is really we can as teammates, we went through a lot. We, uh, in, in four years, I played uh, in 30 different states. Uh, a lot of, back then, we weren't in a conference and the local teams right. didn't want to play us, so we, we traveled. Uh, we got yes. to see the country uh, and played some uh, top 20 schools, but we were kind of thrown, in, uh, thrown into the arena and, and had to rely upon each other and we continue to rely upon each That's other. That's right. That, that common bound uh, binding uh, of us. But you're right, it, it's, it's, uh, it's an unusual group because a lot of uh, guys that I played against in different different colleges, they don't have that. They don't have that no. uh, that, that sense of of uh, band of brothers camaraderie uh, years after they, they've been out. So it's it's really uh, we all feel, feel very fortunate to, to have it, and it's uh, kind of a, the type of thing where you know two o'clock yes. in the morning I'm stranded somewhere, uh, I would call one of those guys and uh, they would have no yeah. no problem coming to get me and, and somebody. They can call me three o'clock in the morning and, and, and I'm heading out the door. So Amen. Uh, it's nice to have that. Jay, I've been lucky enough to be at those Christmas uh, holiday parties and, and you just feel it, you know, and it's yeah. even the coaches like Ted Fiore would be there and all the players that you played even against. Right. Yes. Like, so there's just the common bond is the game of basketball, but then the bond becomes so much more. Um, okay. And then we get a little bit older uh, and things happen. And right. you are a co-founder of Teammates for Life, uh, an organization that is just so important to Fairleigh Dickinson University alums and friends and people. Um, you just came out with a book, which I'm like flattered to have. I got something published uh, uh, by you and your wife. I've got to mention your wife, Maureen. It's just absolutely tremendous book that is going to be a stocking stuffer for at least 10 of my really close friends. But the book is called The Coach Is. 
reflections on people who have impacted our lives. Um, we'll talk about how people can order it, but tell me about what, let's go in the reverse order. Tell me about the book. It had to be Maureen's idea because I, don't, I, don't, I think she's the one that, um, you know, you're the judge in the courtroom, but at home, I think uh, otherwise. Tell me how the book came about. Well, my wife is the wordsmith uh, in the Jorgensen household. Well, yes. I've, 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 uh, I've written or published eight, eight books now, but, I, but she's really the wordsmith. But the, the concept um, for coaches, reflections on people who have impacted our lives uh, has been kicking around in my mind for a while uh, sure. because of the uh, absolute belief that everybody has had somebody who has either said something or done something in our past that's had an impact on us. And obviously, uh, you know, growing up and playing sports all my life, you know, the coach figure is has been very important. And as I mentioned before, my, my high school coach, Ray Newman, I, it's, it's been more than 50 years relationship that we've had and we still, right. still get together. But um, so I started thinking about uh, collecting stories and that's what we started. I, I, I was, coach Aranda, you know, who, who was somebody that, uh, that said something that did something in your past that had an impact on you? And that's how it started. So we started collecting and ultimately, you know, there's 138 people that we've interviewed um, to put this book together. And wow. uh, it's got, um, you know, a whole wide range. It's no longer just coaches because uh, we have mentors uh, that also are coaches and, and teachers and parents. And so uh, other teammates uh, all have uh, had impacts in our lives. And it's important to me uh, to recognize that Oh yeah, uh, but it's also important to me to to have uh, people recognize that for themselves. A nice little sidelight uh, to the to the stories is a lot of guys said, you know, I haven't thought about um, you know coach or I haven't thought about this person in a while, and and, and they'll reach out for them uh, and reconnect. Exactly. So uh, that's that's how the concept came about. I love the book. I love the concept, but most of all, I just love the fact that you know people now are putting their money where their mouth is and that people can um, contribute to teammates for life. Where does the money go? How does it work? And, and how can people get involved? Sure. The, the, uh, the, the purpose for the book uh, is to provide uh, all, all the proceeds go to Teammates for Life Foundation. Uh, and Teammates for Life Foundation was, was started up, uh, co-founded by uh, those four fairly players that graduated in 1978. Yes. Jeff, Jeff Greenberg, Jeff Hunt, Steve McQuinsky, and myself. Yes. And um, the purpose for Teammates for Life is to provide moral and financial support for uh, former college athletes who are, are battling cancer. And uh, we formed it up in, in 2017. And the reason that we did so is because we had some teammates and coaches who were in the middle of um, sure. experiencing that that type of, 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 of battle. Uh, and we wanted to, to try to do something as because uh, as teammates again in, on, on, the, on the hardwood, uh, we, we went through things and, and we had each other's back and um, battling cancer is just an extremely difficult thing to do for any yes. individual. And the, the whole purpose behind Teammates for Life Foundation is, is to let those people know that are going through that, that they don't have to go through it by themselves. They're, they're, we're there for them. And that's what Teammates for Life is all about. And so the, uh, the, the book, yes. Um, I have it on my desk, man. And, it, and like Rich Conrad may be uh, one of the greatest souls I've ever met and one of the great, great players in our school's history. And uh, I still think about him, you know, on a daily basis, man. And uh, I know how much he meant to you. Uh, if, 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 you don't, if you don't mind, one of the stories in here, if you don't mind, it's relatively short. If I if take I can, your time, sure. It's sometimes you have an outstanding teammate who everybody looks up to and relies on. Even the coaching staff seem to realize that person is just like a coach on the court. There seems to be a general comfort zone feeling that if the player is involved, things will turn out right. I was fortunate to have such a teammate my first year playing college basketball. Rich Conrad was that player. He had a fierce inner desire to be the best. He was also a master at harnessing his emotions. I never saw him lose his composure or temper on the court. He was always under control. Rich had an iron resolution that was infectious to the rest of the team. Just six weeks two, 
he nevertheless thought nothing of driving into the lane and taking the ball to the hoop against much bigger opponents. Time after time, he paid the price for those attacks by getting fouled, sometimes very hard. Yet he never backed down. He was the ultimate competitor, and we all looked up to him. He led by example, and we all became better players by emulating him. Just like a coach, Rich was always available to help us deal with our on-court issues. Later in life, Rich came down with a rare form of cancer that ravaged his body. True to form, he attacked his illness head on and refused to let it get him down. He remained positive and supportive of others right up until the time he died. In fact, his battle with cancer was one of the inspirations for the formation of Teammates for Life Foundation. You see on the court, Rich taught us how to act as champions. In combating cancer, Rich taught us how to live as champions. And you're absolutely correct, Richie was uh, an integral part of, of this band of brothers that we have together. And, you know, if you're out there and you haven't, even if you're, you know, you can donate, you don't have to be an FDU alum, uh, but you can be a fan, a friend, or just someone that that wants to, to help. And we have people right now that need that help. And, uh, you know, what you do and what um, Lee Schulman does and Jeff Hunt and, and, and your wife is just so it makes Fairleigh Dickens in a different place, you know, okay. and to change the light of this subject just for a little bit. We need to do this, Jack. Seth Greenberg is always commentating on everybody else's game and every other coach. I need an assessment of Seth Greenberg as a player, as a practice player, and then a game player at Fairleigh Dickinson. I've never really gotten the truth. And guess what? The tr if the truth doesn't come from a judge, it's not coming from anybody. So give me your, you be Seth Greenberg, you be the commentator. What kind of game did he have, Jay? Seth, Seth was an extremely good ball handler. Yep. Um, he was not. That means he, that means he couldn't shoot then. <laughs> well, there was, there was an interesting incident about his shooting abilities. Okay. Uh, and, and remember now, Seth, Seth and I go back a long time we, I know we, that. Were, we, were, we roomed together we, in, the same, in the same room uh, yes. the last two years, junior and senior year. Uh, and, and he's mentioned this, uh, so I'm not telling tales out of story. But we're, we're playing, we're playing a, a, a game, and, and Seth's in the game, and the other team is playing his own defense. And Seth's on the top of, of the key, and he's passing to the right and get it back, pass it to the left. Right. And uh, the, the, the guy at the top of the zone is backing up closer and closer to the foul line and so finally you know nothing's happening we, and so Seth decides well I'm gonna take a shot so he takes a shot he clanks it and as as it's bouncing off of the rim uh, coach Lavabo is, is starting to you know when he got upset the, the veins started to come out oh yeah and he's stopping his feet and he's upset we come down we get the ball back we come back on offense and now uh, the the zone is underneath the foul line <laughs> They're, they're just, you know, yes. daring, daring him to take a shot. Yes. And so uh, he passes to the right, he passes to the left, and it keeps on coming back to him. And, you know, he's kind of looking around and nothing else is happening. So you think, well, okay. So he, he puts it up again, clanked it again. And at that, you can hear Coach Lababa on the sideline just right. going crazy. Immediately a timeout's called. We go into the huddle and Seth says, Coach, he says, I was wide open. And the Papa said, there's a reason that you're wide open. <laughs> Amen. Although he said it in a lot more colorful language. I could, I could imagine. <laughs> oh, that's a classic. But he yeah. was a good point guard and he can handle the basketball. He could, he could, he could, he could, he did, he did wonders with the ball. He really could handle the ball. He, and when he played in high school, he, he had a teammate, Marcus Iberoni, who, who played oh, yeah, uh, with Utah sure. Jazz. Yes. And uh, uh, Marcus is about um, six foot seven, six foot eight. Uh, and wherever he wanted the ball, boom, Seth, Seth was, it was there. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Hey, Jay, time the clock is just ticked, man. You were on the Greg Horrendous show. I, I wish it's, that, it's, that's huge. It's, it is huge. You know, I, I, the, where do I go from here? It's, it's all downhill. <laughs> we got to get Maureen, the, the wordsmith, back on the show. I'm going to get Maureen on the show as well. I promise you that. Okay. Please, I, I can't thank you enough for everything that you do, man. We'll push it at the end of the hour. We'll uh, put up the website and the book, and I'm here for you, and you're, you're one of the great ones, man, Hall of Famer, and uh, 
one of the really, really good people. And I appreciate everything that you do, Jay. For thank us. you. Thank, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. You got great it. To, great, great to be on your show. Thank you.